we are really pleased to be here presenting what we are doing in, from Spain in Apentra, that is essentially creating a new set of tools based on this parallel work technology that is unique from Apentra. That's why this startup was incorporated and, and funded. And essentially what you will be seeing today is how to use this tool to learn best practices about parallel programming with OpenMP and OpenETC for GPU programming and learning this based on a different approach that is called based on understanding your code from the point of view of patterns. So we will try to see and cover all of this approach so that you can really understand how the tool works and you really understand why the tool is able to do what it's doing right now. And I will also try to set up expectations on your side on what the tool can do right now, what we are working to have new features during this year, and what are our expectations for the tool for the next releases, okay? So, uh, as I said, uh, we expect you to learn essentially a different approach to parallel programming. Not just looking at your code, looking at your instructions, the dependencies between them, and try to insert instructions to somehow try and test if everything works just fine. And if you find that the code doesn't work, try to find out where the problem is and fix it by modifying clauses and pragmas. This process is time consuming, it's error prone, it takes a lot of debugging effort. So we want to somehow avoid such an effort in that part of the development workflow by understanding from the very beginning how your code behaves and how this behavior can be used to understand how to code your code from sequential into a parallel version that is correct and that is performant, okay? So for that purpose, what uh, we expect you to learn today is learn how to decompose real codes into these parallel patterns. For this purpose, we have prepared a simplified version of the well-known Lulesh uh, benchmark, of the Coral benchmark from Idle Dynamics uh, scientific field, where using this tool, this, this, ver this version of the code, you can see that you can address complexity in the code and you can try to parallelize with the trainer and learn how to parallelize more or less real codes. Let's see how we can understand the limitations and the current benefits of the tool. Next, what you, we will see is how we can apply this understanding of your applications in terms of patterns, in terms of code patterns, to one single problem, the one that probably has motivated you, motivated you to come here. Try to parallelize port your codes to GPUs using OpenMP and OpenECC. But many of the concepts that you will learn will also be applicable to multi-threaded programming, to synthesization, to other paradigms that you can use to code and to implement the parallel version of your code, not only OpenMP, OpenEC for GPU. So you will learn concepts that are properties of your algorithm, of your code, independently of the hardware platform that you are using, okay? This is the power of this pattern-based approach. And what we have learned, uh, we have done in the tool, we have collaborated with centers from Orange National Lab, NERSC, uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, Julich in Germany, and we have collected and come to an agreement with all of these people of what are somehow best practices for parallel programming using OpenMP and OpenECC. Somehow, what is good for you when you want to implement a code in parallel? Where, in what kind of implementation you can expect to have good performance? What kind of implementation you cannot expect to have good performance and why? Okay, so this best practice for parallel programming is something that we will learn and somehow discuss during the training now uh, in the in before noon. So, sure. So this is only for GPU. This is it's only for GPU, not for CPU. No, oh, you can use the patterns approach, yeah. both for CPU and for GPU. Okay. Indeed, in the parallel trainer tool, you will see that as you can set up and choose between different. CPU, GPU platform, OpenMP, OpenECC standards, and even different programming paradigms like multi-threading, offloading, and tasking, okay? So we will see that in the, in the demonstration of the tool. And of course, do not hesitate to interrupt me at any time. I will be really pleased to answer your questions. So the agenda for today. Before the break, I will try to introduce the minimum set of concepts that you need to understand to go from the CPU to the GPU. We will not go into details of hardware. We will not go into details of the semantics of the pragmas of the clauses. You will learn that by practicing and learning what the tool is doing. You will see the tool doing some work. You will analyze the input and the output of the tool, and you will be able to learn all of those issues. So here we only want to introduce the key concepts that distinguish, differentiate CPU programming from GPU programming. So you have the minimum set of 
knowledge that you need to understand to make good pro programming for the GPU. And then we will show you how to accelerate code using OpenMP and OpenACC. And here I will do a demonstration of the tool, a walkthrough through the graphical user interface, so you can have a first feeling of how the tool looks like and how to use it. Okay? Later, after the break, we will focus on the key uh, theoretical concept of the patterns. Again, very lightweight, just the key concepts you need to understand. And with the help of the tool, you will be able to recognize these patterns and apply different parallelization strategies for each pattern. And here, uh, will, you will be able to do by yourself a practical repeating the code that I have used in my demonstration, the Pi, so that you, on your own, you following the worksheet that Helen and I will share with you during the morning, you will be able to follow a set of steps to get used to the tool, to generate multiple versions of Pi, measure the performance of these different versions on Cori, using the CPU, using the GPU, and with all that knowledge, you will be able to compare and pick up which you think is the best implementation that provides you best performance, okay? So we will use the same example that I have been used here, and you will use the same example here in the practical. Then in, we will have a working lunch. So we will be here having lunch. You will feel free to ask questions and we will sit together to answer all of your, the issues you can, you can raise. In the afternoon, the idea is that if you have a code that you are interested in trying to understand how they compose in terms of patterns and see if you can approach the parallelization of, the tool, of your code with our tool, then we will sit with you to see how you can uh, get a first approach to using the tool with your code. For those that don't have a code, we have prepared the simple example of the simplification of the Lulesh Coral Benchmark, again, with a worksheet, with a detailed set of steps, so you can cover everything you need to create a GPU-enabled OpenACC version and OpenMP version that runs faster on the GPUs of Cori. Okay? So if you have never heard about this code, you don't know what idodynamics is about, it's not my field, you, don't, you will not need that. That's the important thing you need to learn. It's only about the code, how you code your algorithm, what are the properties of this code, and this poses a set of limitations on, on how you can parallelize your code. So the, comp the components, the code patterns, focus on the code, not on the science, not on the hardware platform, only on the code, okay? That's where the key part of the, of the training is. So, okay, this is the agenda for, for today. So let's start with the first set of slides. Who of you here have programmed already the GPU? Someone has already programmed the GPU? Someone has, yeah, someone has used OpenMP? No OpenMP, no OpenACC, no parallelism? Okay, great. Uh, then it's, it's, it's a good approach to have this content here because we begin from the very basics. We don't assume any previous knowledge on parallel programming, on GPU programming, on multi-core programming. So feel free to ask questions because this course is for you. We begin from scratch. Okay, so let's go on to lecture number one, introduction to OpenMP, OpenACC, and GPUs. Okay, GPU is kind of a trending topic. Everyone wants to program the GPUs because the colleague is also working on the GPUs and is getting amazing speed ups on the code, okay? So somehow the GPUs are a trending topic and it is, a, it is supposed to be kind of the future for, to get good performance or peak performance on peak scale and exascale supercomputers, the machines that are being uh, manufactured now that will come in the next generation. Why? Because the CPU usually takes a, a lot of power. The GPU consumes like, less power. Exascale roadmaps, that is building the next generation of the most powerful supercomputers in the world, mostly all of them, I, I think this, this, is, this is from November, nine out of the 10 supercomputers use accelerators. Five of them are using GPUs. Others are using a different types of accelerators. So if you want to port your code to one of these machines to make big science, then somehow you will need to take advantage of the GPUs to get resources allocated for your code, okay? And apart from that, GPUs are ubiquitous. Or in my laptop, I even have a GPU. So I can install the full software stack and use OpenACC or other programming languages to accelerate my code on my laptop. So it's something that uh, somehow you need to learn because at some point you will need it to port your codes for peak performance to make good science and big science. So what is the GPU? Uh, the GPU is designed, is a hardware specialized and designed to, to make 
massive floating point operations. So while the host or the CPU, you usually see it as a set of floating point units with more or less, that are more or less limited in time, in, 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 in number, in the GPU, you can see it as thousands of floating point unit operations, independent of each other, that you can use at the same time. So this provides all doing many things at the same time in different pieces of the hardware, provides a lot of computational power that you can use to accelerate your code, okay? So somehow, what you can imagine is that uh, you need to somehow specify how your code can be executed in vector instructions, okay? Somehow. You, you can just remember this idea. Vector instruction is something that if you execute one, one instruction on a vector unit, you're using only one of the lanes of the vector unit. So four lanes, one, one instruction, you are not using three out of four floating point units. So imagine that you have thousands of them. If you run sequentially, you cannot expect to have good or big performance out of a design of a hardware like the GPU. So don't run sequential code on the GPU because it will typically be as, as slower or much slower than running a simple multi-threaded code on the GPU, on the CPU. And apart from that, we will not go into those details. We, I will, will only introduce you some of the concepts you need to understand why the GPU has a complex memory design. The reason why it is so powerful is that all of these thousands of floating point units can access to memory units that are dedicated to groups of these floating point units. But what this, this poses limitations in the communication between the threads. So not all threads can communicate with all the remaining threads. This is a different characteristic from the CPU. Whenever you create a CP OpenMP multi-threaded program, all the threads you create can communicate with the rest of the threads. This doesn't happen on the GPU. Because of, somehow, it's an implication of the complex memory design and the complex hierarchy that you have on the GPU, okay? So just remember these things, and you will see how we will be introducing a few concepts so that to see how you can use the GPU and the complex memory design to accelerate your code in despite of the complexity of the hardware. We will, you will not go, need to go deep into the hardware details to accelerate your codes using OpenMP and OpenACC. Okay, so in contrast to the CPU model, to multi-threading, we usually have one host and one memory. So you start your sequential code here, it uses the memory to make the computations and provide you the result. If you enable the code with multi-threading, with OpenMP, you have multiple threads here running at the same time, uh, making access to the same memory to provide you the result. When you want to use the GPU, you need to start your application, your code on the CPU, either single-threaded or multi-threaded, but it needs to start on the CPU. And at some point, you need to specify a region of the code that in CUDA terminology, for instance, is called a kernel, that you offload to the GPU. Offloading means that a, a separate binary is created for the hardware of the GPU. That, hard, that binary is transferred to the device, so you need to transfer all the data the, that you have in the memory of the host needs to be transferred to the memory of the device. So data transfer is a prerequisite for your code to run on the GPU. Okay? This is what is typically known as the GPU accelerator model. You have a host, a device, each one has its own memory, and you need to transfer information, code, and data from the CPU to the GPU, host to device, and back from the GPU to the CPU, from the device to the host. Okay? And this is essentially what you will specify when you add OpenMP and OpenACC capabilities. You will say, I want from this code, this piece of code to be offloaded to the device and you will need to specify what data needs to be transferred, okay? So, we have just said more or less all of these things. GPU execution model is host-driven execution model. Remember that your code will start on the CPU. Only the parts that you specify that will be offloaded to the GPU will be executed on the GPU. And, but the results will be transferred back to the CPU. That, that is the code that will provide you with the results of your science, okay? Sequential code runs on a conventional processor, on the CPU of your machine. So the computational intensive part of your code need to be transferred and accelerated on the GPU, okay? And to maximize performance on the GPU, what you need is to identify those parts of your code that consume most of the execution time. This is what is typically known as hotspots when you do a profiling of your application, okay? How many of you have made a profiling of the application? 
get half-half, more or less is the numbers that we get when they make these questions. Many people have even ported code to CPUs, multi-threaded and GPUs, and they have never profiled the code. So if you start from scratch with a code that you don't know, it's mandatory that you start with a profiling so that you will focus only on, in the first, time, first steps, in those parts that consume most of the time. One hour of effort in development time that you invest there will provide you a, a greater, a, a bigger return of investment than focusing on a part of the code that's only 5% of the execution time, okay? That's why combining this with profiling is, is important. So once you have these parts of the code identified, what you need to keep in mind is more or less these three uh, guidelines. Transfer the data onto the device and keep it there. What that means is transferring mem data from the memory of the CPU to the memory of the GPU is the most computational consuming part of your GPU accelerated code. You need to minimize it. If you can't transfer data, leave it there and never transfer it back. Just leave it there and use it. Don't transfer it back, okay? So remember minimizing data transfer and leave it on the device if possible. Give the device enough, enough work to do. Remember that you have thousands of floating point units. If you use only 10% of the floating point units, you are using the GPU, but you are not using 90% of the floating point units that are available for your code. What this means in general is that you will need to run big problem sizes to take advantage of the computational power of the GPU, okay? And um, the third one is what we already mentioned, data reuse. Use the, the data that you have already in the device, either because it has been transferred at the beginning of the program or because it has been computed and produced on the GPU. Just leave it there and reuse it as much as you can. Avoid data transfers, that's what you need to, to have in mind. Okay, so more or less we have a very basic understanding of the GPU execution model, and more or less some guidelines of what we need to have in mind whenever we design or we implement our uh, uh, parallel codes. So let's go on and see why using OpenMP or OpenACC in contrast to many other programming tools that you can have in the, in the ecosystem. So, first of all, GPUs have a reputation of being very difficult to program, and they are difficult to program. Indeed, if you want to program the GPU to achieve peak performance using CUDA, using OpenCL, you really have to rewrite completely your code. Probably you have to rewrite your data structures, you have to recode your algorithms, your loops, in order to adapt all the program to the hardware and to the features of the hardware, okay? So we, what we want to do is we want to avoid that because that's very time consuming, very complex, has a very high learning curve. So how do we do that? Okay, OpenMP and OpenACC are here to help us to bridge that gap. So essentially what they provide us is a set of directives, a simple application program interface that we can incrementally use to add op GPU enabled parts of our code incrementally without rewriting the whole code as we have to do in lower level parallel programming tools like CUDA or like uh, OpenCL. OpenMP and OpenACC are designed with productivity in mind. What this means is that um, when you create a parallel, creating a parallel version of your code is very time consuming, it's complex. You need a lot of expertise to do so. So whenever you create your parallel version, the question that you have is, okay, I created it, for system one, but I need to do bigger science to run it on system two. Can I run it on system two? Can I port the code to system two so that it runs and provides the, the correct results? So OpenACC and OpenMP have been designed with portability in mind. What that means is that as you do with your sequential code, you just recompile your code with appropriate flags on a different system and the code should, uh, should run, okay? And also with readability. Um, Remember that if you use, uh, have you used MPI for instance? All of you have used MPI. The sequential code, if you want to create an MPI version, you have recoded, completed your code. Maybe you can recognize some of the loops, but you have made MPI init, MPI finalize, all the data transfers, all the communications. So the parallel code and the sequential code hardly resemble one another, okay? So OpenMP and OpenC are decided, designed to avoid that. You can have your sequential code, 
you add OpenMP, OpenACC capabilities to the pragmas, but you still have one piece of code that you need to maintain and improve. Not two or three separate codes, one of it's tailored or um, specifically designed for one parallel programming tool, okay? Another good thing about OpenMP and OpenACC is that they abstract away many details of the hardware. If you're coding MPI, for instance, you need to code to program every single communication between every single pair of processors or, or set of processors. On the GPU, if you code at a low level using a library like uh, CUDA or OpenCL, you need to code where the, code, the, threads, the, the kernels are launched, how they communicate, what, they, what parts of the memory they access, what different levels of the memory hierarchy they are using, the global memory, the shared memory, the scratch pad, the cache. You have a very complex hardware on the GPU. So you need to be aware of that when you program at the low level. So the good things about OpenMP and OpenACC, we will see it today, many of those details are abstracted away for you. You don't need to care about them. Just to note that some of them exist and provides you OpenMP and OpenACC some ways to control how to use some of these hardware features, okay? So a, a implication of all of this is that it minimizes the need for code refactoring. Sequential code, when you wrote your first MPI version, you recorded your application probably most of it. So OpenMP and OpenACC are decide, designed to avoid that. You just add some pragmas, enable some flags in the compiler that converts those pragmas into a parallel code. And if you don't want to use them, just disable the flag of the compiler and you will have your original sequential code. No need to have maintained different versions of, of your code, okay? And uh, OpenMP, OpenACC support C, C++, and Fortran, okay? In order to correctly set the expectations that you may have on Power Trainer tool at this moment, at this moment we are supporting the C programming language because of some technical implications. But we are working and we expect during this year to have full support for C++, especially for C-like code within C++ uh, files. And also we are working on Fortran, so we have first a result that we will be presenting in IHC in Frankfurt in two weeks in, in Germany. But we hope to have some of this Fortran support by the end of the year by supercomputing. But it's something that I want to set correctly the expectations. We're working on it very hard, but let's see how we can, we can do it. So all the examples that you will use today are written in the C programming language. Are all of you familiar with the C programming language? More or less? Yeah. Yes. All the method about the composition of the code in patterns, this applies to any simple any, any programming language. It's independent of the programming language that you are using. What is uh, um, tied to C is the current version of Parallel Trainer 1.2 that we have installed in Core in Cori and we will be using today. Okay? But we will improve the the product so that we can support C and Fortran in the tool. We can evaluate that. As long as you recode some of your functions in a C-like style within the C++ code, you can analyze those files with the Parallel Trainer tool, okay? We have done it in the past, so we can do it, but it's very, it's very dependent on the features of the C++ programming language that you are using in your code. We need to evaluate that. Yes, the tool help you to parallelize single-threaded code. Single-threaded code may be sequential serial code or maybe an MPI rank within an MPI application. So somehow you can use our tool to make hybrid your MPI application. Okay, that's another usage of the tool. Multi-GPU support, not at this moment. At this moment we are working with supporting one GPU. Good question.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. We will see it in the demonstration that we do of the tool in a few minutes. Okay? We will see that. Okay, any other questions? Great. Okay, so finally, what are OpenMP and OpenACC? They are one more method to use the GPUs. And they are designed as extensions to the programming language. That is, the pragmas and directives extend C, C++, or Fortran. So if you have your code, you have to add the syntax of the directives and the pragmas to add OpenMP or OpenAC capabilities to your code. It's an extension to the language. It's not part of the language itself. It uses compiler directives. What that means is that you have the support of a compiler that whenever you specify the app, the correct pragma, directives, and clauses, it is the compiler that does the hard work for you. If you code in MPI, you need to decide when you expound the, the ranks, when they communicate, when they finish, so that one at the end finishes the execution. It's you who has to decide and make that implementation. So in OpenMP and OpenACC, we will specify where a parallel region begins, where a parallel region ends, and with the support of the compiler, it will generate the compiler, the code, the binary code, to create the threads using POSIX threads and to destroy the threads at the end of the parallel region. You don't need to worry about all the complexity of using the underlying threading library available in the operating system. Okay? So this is what compiler directives and having a com the support of a compiler means in OpenMP and OpenACC. Both of them use a host accelerator programming model. Remember that it is the CPU that starts the execution and that controls the execution. We are only offloading the most computation intensive parts to the GPU and the CPU is waiting for the results coming from the GPU. Remember that it is a host driven execution model. And all of this, both of them use the concept of thread or task. So more or less uh, simplifying it a lot, you can consider the abstract concept of task and several implementations as threads, as processes, some tasks that collaborate to solve one single problem in parallel to finish early, faster, and to provide you the same numerical result, okay? And again, they are focused on, on portability of your code. You want your code to be executed on Cori, but you also want your code to be executed on the next machine that will come to NERSC. And you also want your code to be executed on your laptop or in other supercomputer that you need to use for the purposes of your science, okay? That's what portability means. Okay, so just to finish that, almost to finish that this part, benefits and limitations of OpenMP and OpenACC. Benefits, OpenMP and OpenACC are simple to use, you will see it. They are portable across different systems, just recompiling your code, as you do with your sequential code, and they are hardware independent. When you have an OpenMP code, it will run on any multi-threaded operating system, as long as you have support in the corresponding compiler of the OpenMP standard or of the OpenACC standard, okay? Limitations, as we said before, we have the advantage of making parallel programming more productive, faster, better use of our time, but this comes at a cost. The cost is that you cannot control everything in your program. You can only control that those features that are exposed in the application program interface of OpenMP and OpenACC. If you want to do something different, then you need to go and use an, different tools like CUDA or OpenCL that are designed to allow you to control everything that you can do on the GPU. But for that reason, they are much more complex, complicated to use. And of course, OpenMP and OpenCC are designed to be interoperable with other programming languages. So that in the end, if you need it, you could use uh, several tools in your, in your program, okay? So finally, again, to set correctly the expectations. When you first go take your code and take it to the GPU, you can expect your code to be significantly, significantly slower than the code on the CPU. That's what happens most of the time in the first versions. So once you learn the basic knowledge, and once you know how to use the standards and how to code for the GPU using OpenMP and OpenACC, you can begin to think how to make your parallel implementation better so that you can increase incrementally the performance of your application. And at some point, your GPU code will be faster than the CPU code, okay? So in order to opti optimize performance, remember, on the GPU, you need to reuse data. That's number one priority. Avoid data transfers whenever you can, 
allocate memory directly to the GPU, use it there, compute there, and avoid data transfers back and forth from this, between the two memory systems of the host and the device, okay? And again, for peak performance, you, you, when, you, when we see papers or articles or announcements about the computational power of the GPU, we many times see applications that run 200 times faster than the original code, 70 times faster than the original code. How can you achieve that? You can achieve that peak performance usually by making a very sophisticated programming of the GPU. So for an, an average application, having a realistic performance of your application being three, five, 10 times faster is something that you can consider a good performance on the GPU without going into the burden of all of the details of the low level programming interfaces of CUDA or OpenCL, okay? So depends on the application again, you can, depending on the characteristics of the patterns of your application, you can even obtain higher speed ups, but it pretty much depends on your application, okay? So, um, before doing the demonstration of the tool, just let's do a very fast uh, review of the, of the steps you have to do in order to, in general, parallelize your code. In particular, to parallelize your code to execute it on a GPU. So you begin, remember, profiling your code. If you have never done it, it would be good that you follow one of these courses to make a simple profiling to, to double check and be sure that the functions you are working on are those that really consume most of the execution time, okay? That will return you the biggest return of investment of your effort in going to the GPU. So identify the hot spots. Second, probably the most difficult part of parallelizing for any platform. Analyze your code to discover parallelism, okay? So you need to understand your code. As we said, here is where the components approach, the patterns approach that we will be using provides a lot of value and is completely different to other approaches that you can see in similar courses or tutorials or workshops. So in Analyze for Parallelism is where you will see the value of understanding your code in terms of code components. Next, once you know the hotspots, the loops, understand them in terms of parallelism and you say, okay, this loop can be parallelized, then you need to decide how to implement that parallelism. That's what we say here, adding directives in the using OpenMP or OpenECC. These are implementations of the parallelism you have discovered in the second step. So implementation of parallelism with directives. Again, in this third step, a directives, Parallel Trainer will help you to produce many implementations using OpenMP and OpenECC of your single C code. So we will help in these two stages mainly. So when you produce a parallel code, then you need to compile it and run it and measure performance. Did the performance increase? Yes. Is it enough for me, for my problem? Stop and do, go to do another, a, di a different stuff. If not, then you need to optimize your code, which typically means improve data locality, minimize data transfers on the GPU, and start again reprofiling to see if now the profiling, the hotspot that you have found before, is again and keeps on being the most computation intensive part of your code. Okay, so this is an iterative process that you need to repeat. Okay, so when you go through all of this, essentially what you, what you will find is that you have your code, you have your hotspot, you have identified parallelism, you have implemented a parallel version that runs faster than the original code. So you will be accelerating this part of the code. But in order to get peak, peak performance, this 100 speed up acceleration, you need to also parallelize all of this sequential region. This will be with the bottleneck to, to really achieve this big uh, speed up, uh, speed ups in real applications, okay? So this is essentially the effect of parallelizing loops. So let's go to the demonstration. So in the demonstration, you will see OpenMP and OpenAC pragmas. So what you will see is C code with something, some extensions. These extensions have the form of a preprocessor pragma, this special symbol pragma, what is called a sentinel, Sentinel identifies the family of pragmas that you are using. OpenMP uses the Sentinel OMP. OpenACC uses the Sentinel ACC. What that means is that after that Sentinel, you have the name of the directive. We will use parallel, we will use for, we will use critical, we will use atomic, we will use data, 
different pragmas that by default they have a meaning, they have a behavior that is specified in the standard, but that you can modify using several clauses to modify the default behavior of each of the directives. Okay? So this is essentially what you will see in new C, C++ with the, for, with the syntax of a pragma, in Fortran with the syntax of a special comment with this dollar symbol before the sentence. Okay? But the rest is typically the same, the directive with the clauses to modify the default behavior. Okay, and just finally to get started with the demonstration, OpenMP and OpenACC compilers, we have several of them. Probably the most mature OpenACC compiler is PGI in the market. We have a newer version in Cori 19.4, I think. We also have a Cray machine with a Cray compiler that also supports OpenMP and OpenACC. And also uh, in GCC and in Clang, there's free uh, open source compilers. You also have support for OpenMP, very mature support. And also they are pushing, uh, moving forward support for OpenACC too. So in the most recent versions of GCC compiler, you can also compile OpenACC pragmas and OpenMP pragmas, okay? So I think that all of these compilers are available on Cori, and we will be using the PGI compiler and the GC compiler for the experimentations today, experimentation today, okay? Any question before going to the demonstration of the tool? Okay. I will run the tool in my laptop, but you will run it on Cori. So the way you will launch it is just you will receive the instructions to launch a command that is called PWU, PW, sorry, trainer. And this is the graphical user interface. It more or less resembles a, just a minute, I don't see here all the layout. It is losing some part of the screen. Okay, so this is the UI that you will see when you open the, 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 the tool. So you will see on the left-hand side a project manager that like you have in many developing uh, source code editors that you can manage different project, product, projects at the same time. So here you have the option to select LulishMK, the one that you will be using in the afternoon, hit, or you can even, with clicking on file, open project, you can open a new project for instance, let's open, I have several projects here for the demonstration, let's open the Py example. Click on choose, and then you have this Py example here. One thing that is important to note is that the project is essentially a directory in your file system. Nothing else than that, okay? Where we store some hidden information that you will see during today that you can recover and take it away with you with all the work that you have done during the practicals, okay? This is important because many times you will have real codes with your own build system, compilation system, scripts to run the code. So we don't want to interfere on that part. So you, you just open the directory as you have in, you're using control version system in Git. For Git, a directory is what is under version control. For us, it's a directory and all the contents where it's a project for Paraguay Trainer. <coughs> so whenever you open the project, the tool scans the directory and provides you with the contents of the project. In this case, if you double click on the example code pi, you will see the code that we are using. And you will see these special green circles here. What this means is that just double clicking in real time, parallel work technology has analyzed your code, has found all the loops that you have, has, has checked that some of the loops cannot be analyzed for some reason. It can report on that. But it will provide your green circle if your, your loop is a candidate for a loop that you can convert, uh, that you can parallelize, okay? It has, double, it has checked that it fulfills a minimum set of properties that is to provide you with information that this is a loop where you can start to begin to, to analyze in terms of parallelism and introduce parallelism, okay? When you click on these green circles, you are open this dialogue. In this dialogue, we will be using in the morning these three panels here, where you can see, you can choose between OpenMP or OpenACC. 
CPU or GPU, multi-threading or offloading. Let's begin with a simple example of OpenMP, CPU, multi-threading. What I want to generate is a multi-threaded version of the Pi code to run on a CPU that has multiple cores. Okay? So once you select that, you click on Parallelize, this button here. And here it is. The tool has analyzed the code, has discovered the parallelism, and has added pragmas for you. These pragmas are correct and accelerate your code. Okay? How the tool has done this? Let me scroll up. Remember that we have an approach based on patterns. Somehow the tool discovered the type of pattern that you can find here. So in the lower part of the, of the UI, you have three consoles. One for building, compiling your code. One for the execution. Once it is compiled and you run it, you output information in the console. You will see it here. And finally, the parallel world console. This is where parallel world reports the messages of the analysis that has been done. So here it is saying, at line 27, the original line 27, it found a scalar reduction pattern, where you have a variable that is somehow processed using a commutative and associative operator. This is everything you need to know to determine that this loop can be executed safely in parallel. Okay? So in the first line, in the parallel console, the tool will provide you with the pattern that has been able to discover. In after, la after the break, we will see the family, the set of patterns that we have available in the tool at this moment. And you will learn to recognize them. After that, you can see this available parallelization strategies for the variable sum. What this means is that once the code has been identified, the pattern has been identified, the tool supports different ways of implementing parallel versions using OpenMP or OpenCC and different programming paradigms. Okay? So you will be able to select which of these implementations you want to generate with the tool. And this is done automatically by the tool. You just have to give the appropriate instructions. Okay? So here, by default, it has selected a strategy number one, a scalar reduction. We will see that in the after, after the break. What this means, essentially, is that when you have the code, the tool has said, okay, it is the loop that you want to execute in parallel. Let's enclose it in a pragma that defines the parallel region. The parallel region with the pragma OMP parallel is saying, here begins the parallel region. So for, until this moment, you only have one thread. At this moment, different threads are created. So all the threads collaborate until the end of the parallel region. At this point, all of them are destroyed, and only one continues. Okay? This is what parallel means. Four, what means is that in order for you to parallelize a loop, you need to divide the workload, the number of iterations between different threads. If you have 10 iterations and two threads, and each thread executes the whole set of 10 iterations, you will be really running a different problem with 20 iterations. That is not what you want. So you need to divide the 10 iterations among the set of threads that you have created. How do you do that in OpenMP? With another pragma, OMP, with the keyword for. This is what is called work sharing. How to uh, divide the iterations of the loop among the threads. Okay? And finally, you can disclose reduction. It is, the, it is saying that the variable sum is implemented using a scalar reduction parallelization strategy. We will see in detail in, in the afternoon, after the break, how all of these parallelization strategies behave. But what I want you to see right now is that you will be able to choose between different parallelization strategies. And finally, provide you some information about the generation of the code, how the code has been implemented in parallel. If you don't know exactly what a scalar reduction means, the, the trainer also comes with a knowledge base that we will be improving and growing with, with the different versions that we release. So if you look at this message and you'll see this underlined text and you click on it, you will be presented with a glossary of terms where it explains what a scalar reduction is. And if you want to learn more, you can click in some of the glossary terms on learn more. I will provide you with a more complete uh, description and with examples in C and Fortran of how a scalar reduction looks like in these languages. So somehow, some, some, some part of the important knowledge about the pattern that you need to learn for parallel programming is also available within the tool. You don't need to go anywhere else to find it. 
So let's close that. Okay, so we have generated one version. Um, let's compile it. How do we compile it? If you look at these buttons here, this is the settings button where you can specify the command you will use to build your code. So let's use, for instance, GCC, activating the OpenMP support, pi.c minus L. What this command means is that you will be using GCC. You can use PGI, Clang. We are not, you are not tied to any compiler. It's just the set of compilers that you have available in the system. Cori has many compilers available. Minus F OpenMP is the flag that you use to activate support for, for OpenMP pragmas. What this means is that the compiler, GCC, will take these pragmas and will generate parallel code to implement the semantics of the parallel pragma, of the four pragma, all the pragmas that you have specify here. If you don't enable this flag, these pragmas will be ignored and you will have sequential code. As simple as that, okay? Then these are regular options, the name of the file and the name of the executable. So, yes? I cannot hear you, sorry. Uh, some of them, but not all. Some of them, but not all. But you have mechanisms, we will show you next, how to specify environment libraries, environment variables that you need, okay? Let's first run a simple example, and we can do that this later. Yes? Yeah, yeah. I can do it later also. I have a make file there in the project. So I, ha I prefer to use this to introduce the command and the flags because many of you use the first time that you use, you are using OpenMP. But there is no restriction. Here, you put the command that you would execute in this path in the terminal. If you go to the terminal and execute the same command, it's exactly what the tool is doing behind the scene, okay? So if we specify this command, and now we click on this hammer button, build project, here it is. The code has been compiled successfully and now we have the executable generated. Now we want to run it. How do we run it? We go again to the settings button, we select the tab run, and we put here the run command. Okay, so I click on okay. Now I click on this play button to run. It starts the execution, and in a different console it outputs the, out, the output on a st standard input and a standard output of the execution of the command. Everything you see here is the same as you, was, you will see in the terminal, from a terminal execution, okay? So this has run sequentially. So how can we run this in parallel using several threads? We can go to the run command and we can prepend here OMP num threads equals one. What, what, this is, what is this is that um, OpenMP and OpenSC provide you with pragmas, directives, functions, and with environment variables. Through the environment variables, you can control several things. One of the things you can control is the number of threads that you will be using in the parallel region. So if I specify one, what will mean that I have a parallel region with only one thread, so sequential execution. I can run it like this. Click the play button again. And now I have the sequential execution, 1.5 seconds. So somehow, by default, the environment variables of, the, of my system was assuming a different number of threads. How can I change the number of threads? We have two ways to do it. You can just change here to four threads, for instance, change the command and execute again. Here it is. Or you can use this advanced button here. And here you can specify number of threads, for instance. Number of threads equals four. And here you can also specify any other LD, library, path, whatever you need. This replies to your question, okay? These are the two mechanisms that we provide to control environment variables. Through the advanced button, you can add them here, 
or you can prepend it to the execution command. Of course, if you invoke a makefile, the makefile inside can set up all the environment, environment variables that you can need or use. Uh, I will need to check that. I think it does. I think it, the, uh, the tool creates a terminal environment that I think inherits from the setup where the Parallel Trainer tool was run. That will probably be specified in the, in the user manual. I will try to check it and, and give you an answer to that. Okay? Okay, so. We can also replace this by make and this by make run. Probably it will work. And clean, we want to clean the project by make clean. So I can clear the terminals. I can build. This is the command invoked by the make. So you can put any script that you need to build your code. When I click on play, it runs. This is what is invoked by the make, the run target of the make file that I have specified in the project. And this is the execution. Yeah? PG? PGM. What is PGM? So What was the question? Sorry. So this is make file. You're using the make file. And yes. For another uh, like kind of like a make file, but it's called BGM. So that's another building build system, I guess. Okay. Building in principle, you can use any build system that you want, and the way you invoke it in the terminal, you have to invoke it exactly in the same way in the settings box. So I don't I don't see any potential issue there. Yes, if the you have the library pre-compiled, yes. you just need to link it uh -huh. to produce the executable of your code. So in the end, it's, it's adding more and more options to the build command of your application. Sorry, Correct. I so you can also use a make file from your system here, right? If I have it yeah. right. Let me, let me check. We can open, let me check where this project pi is. Okay. From the terminal, this is another terminal. I can go to NERSC, examples, pi. This is what I have here. So again, this is the same contents that you can see there. You can type here, make clean, make, make run. So this is essentially the same that is happening inside the tool. Yes, yeah. any script that you have to invoke a sequence of commands that you need to run, you can invoke it from the terminal. If you can invoke it from the terminal, you can invoke it from the tool. So if I invoke it from terminal, it's not showing the like building output to show in a, uh, in a software, right? Like at which line you will call those kind of messages. When you analyze the code. Uh, in the software, when you build, here you see the same messages between the starting and make. This is exactly what you see in the terminal. When you run between a starting and this, this is exactly what you see in the terminal. Is there any way to see the target and output in the terminal? Uh, no, we are not providing a command line interface at this moment. We have a different tool that we are designing that is called Parallel Web Analyzer that will provide your command line interface to this kind of capabilities. It will be designed and intended for batch processing and compilation outside of the UI. It's something that is work in progress.
Okay. Any other questions? In this case, you go to settings, you go to run, and here you can run the name of the executable. If you run it like that, okay. it will prompt, it will show you the usage message as any other tool. So you can add more and more commands in the command line. That's easy enough? Yeah. Okay. You say something like, like, a like pi redirection minus yeah. input. So there it is. Yes. If you can use it in the terminal, you can use it here. If your, your, if your code is prepared for that, you can use it there. Yeah. <coughs> More questions? Yeah. So this is only one code pi dot t. If yeah. you have several, then when you do the analysis, so where I you put it, uh, open the MP. So how, how can you do that? There's uh, several code mode only here. It's only one loop. Okay, in this current version, mm -hmm. Parallel World Trainer 1.2, mm -hmm. we can discover opportunities for parallelization in one file at a time. What that means is that if you open the file, all the functions that you <coughs> use in the for loop are defined within the same file, we can analyze it. We can discover parallelism. No problem with that. Mm -hmm. What is different is that if you call one function, that is defined in another second file, mm -hmm. second file.c. That is something that is work in progress that we are, we are about to finish, and that's a feature that is expected to come in Parallel Trainer 1.3. That, that is a feature that is needed for big codes because you usually call functions in one file mm -hmm. that are defined in different files. Yeah. So you need to somehow analyze several files mm -hmm. all together. Yeah. That's something that is work in progress. We are about to finish it. Right. It will probably come in Parallel Trainer version 1.3. At this moment, one file at a time. We are working on that, yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, more questions? So if I have like multiple files and all of them have the main functions, so can I analyze the other files that does not have the main functions? Uh, for the point of view of the analysis of parallel work, main is just another function. Okay. So what we do is we analyze the code and we try to find a function and all the functions that are called from this function to try to discover opportunities for parallelization. So from that point of view, main is just another one. Main is important when you build the code to generate executable, but not for us to do the analysis. Okay? okay? Yeah. In big applications, you usually have multiple files with multiple mains. So it is your building system that needs to treat its main separately. But from the point of view of our analysis, it's just another function. Okay? Good. Um, okay, one more thing I want to show you. Imagine that you are working on your project. You have made this change. And now you don't want this implementation. What do you do? You need to recover somehow the original version, okay? So in order to facilitate that uh, workflow, that way of work, here we have, you have this angle here. You cannot see it, but this is an angle. That when you open it, oh, now you can see it. When you click on it, it opens this part of here. What this means is that Whenever you click on the green button, green circle, choose the options, click on parallelize, 
and the code changes, this is changing your actual p.c file. But before doing that, we save a backup copy of the code that you had before inserting the pragmas. Okay? So this appears here. This is kind of a built-in versioning system that you have that you keep, you can maintain different parallel versions that are of interest for you and your project. Okay? So for instance, I can take this, you cannot see there. Let me. If I click on original one, you can see that this is the original code with no pragmas. If I click on this a route to the left here, what I do is I restore this version in the actual file of my compilation. So if I click, it will ask me, are you sure you want to do this? Because the tool is going to replace the contents of pi.c with the original version. So you need to know what are the, the, the versions that you have here. Somehow you save versions for your milestones as you make progress. So if you do something that you don't want, you can restore one of these versions to begin again in a, in a checkpoint state. Sorry? I have the air here, it's difficult to hear. Okay, what did I do to make it? Okay. Let me cancel. We were here. Okay? So let's click on the versions. And now you have different files here. Every single change or parallelization that you generate generates a backup copy. So now if you want to restore one of these original copies to discard those changes, you can just click on this button here, restore this version to the editor. You have to confirm that as it will be all about writing the contents. I say OK. And now I have again the same version that I had it. Okay? These versions, you can delete these versions. When you click here, you can confirm the deletion of the versions. Let me, just for the sake of clarity, delete all these versions of tests we did yesterday. Okay. So the suggested workflow, even original one, I can delete it. The suggested workflow for the practicals is as follows. Click on the green circle, generate, open MP, CPU, multi-threaded version, parallelize. It will generate the original one. Okay? So now, you can click on it if you want to rename it. It's up to you. But what you can do is, by clicking on this button, you can save a version explicitly, not automatically. So you say, OK, I want to create a new version that is Pi using OpenMP using the reduction clause. And now I have my version here. At this moment, what I can do is restore the original version and again click on the buttons and say, OK, I want an OpenACC GPU offloading version. I click on Parallelize and here is your OpenACC equivalent implementation. OK? So you can see some similarities between OpenMP and OpenACC up to this level. Parallel, parallel same semantics, where the region begins and ends. For and loop, more or less same semantics, word sharing. The iterations are shared among the threads. Reduction, reduction. The scalar reduction pattern that has been found needs to be computed as a reduction in OpenMP and OpenACC. And then you have some additional clauses that we will see later. Okay? But you can compare them and you can learn from that. And with this, you can generate all the versions that you want. I can generate Pi using ACC reduction.c. One more thing we can show at this moment. Okay, you have been doing in your practicals, you have been doing all of this work. And the question is, now you're working here, you have access to Cori, to Parallel Trainer, the workshop finishes, you go back to your office, how do you take away all of your work? How, do you have to lose all of this? Do you have to make copy and paste of all of this? You don't have to do it. 
So let's see how the things are stored in the file system. If you remember, this is what you see so far. But everything that, that the tool has been doing is not lost. It is stored under the same directory, example spy. So where is it? It is in a hidden directory named .pwt. So under the, the tool is where it keeps track of all the copies, all the versions, named versions of each file that you open and you work with. So this is sequential code. This is code that can compile and run. So if you compress all this directory with this hidden file, you have everything you have, you, you have done during the practical. You have to compress it to take it away with you. This is exactly like uh, control version systems work. They create these hidden .git directories, .svn directories. So we do it in the same way. So, so as not to interfere with, the, with other tools, but to make it very portable. You can just compress it, take it away to another file system. Even if you have the tool, you open it, and it will recognize all this hidden information. Okay? What you lose is all the usability features that you have in the graphical user interface if you don't have the Paraguay trainer. But you have all the work that you have done. That's the important part when you come to workshops or you can you use the tool to generate versions. Okay? So that's important why it's important why you need to define correctly the directory of your project. Because everything that you do will be stored here under the directory that you have chosen. Okay? Yes? Um, so here is only one file. Yes. Yeah. So if I do multiple files. Let's do something. Uh, let's go to the terminal. Let's copy p.c as new file.c. So somehow you have been working with another tool to further develop your code. You have created new files that you can integrate in your build system and you, can, you, can, you want to analyze with the trainer. Is this what you mean? But you create you more files yes, using a separate tool. Is it? Well, you cannot use it in your tool. Um, you cannot load. So here is your Mm, okay, now I think I understand the question. So if you do it from the terminal, whenever you open the project, it rescans the directory and the file appears here, okay? So your question is if you can copy the file, manage the file system from within no, the project manager. From your file, so if you From here. Create a copy? I mean, I mean the, for the menu, you have a file, right? Yeah. From the menu file, these are the options you have. Yeah. Can you load, load another file added to this project? So this project is called Pi, right? Pi project. Yes. Yeah. So can you add an, another file to this project? Okay. Directly from the tool. Uh, so no. That's why you go, go back to the terminal to add okay. your file. Copy, right? So can you here directly to load another file to this project? Uh, so this is only from from the graphical user interface, we don't have the capability. Because uh, that's something that we discuss internally, because these are the kind of features that you have in professional in IDs, professional code editors. You can manage 
all the files that you have in the file system from the graphical user interface of the code editor. But here, the problem is that every single user that we talk to, they usually use different editors. They have their preferred editor. They don't want to change their editor for developing. So we have tried to minimize the amount of features that we have to manage projects in the trainer. Because the user prefers one, one Eclipse, other one Qt Creator, other one uh, Buy. So every single user, developer has its preference for a different development environment. So here we decided to minimize the amount of features to manage the projects. Because they usually will be, do be doing that through your preferred professional environment. That's the, the feedback we have got from, from the people. Uh, so here you're open project. Can yeah. you create a Again. So this is, uh, so the, uh, you have uh, this pipe project, right? So can okay. I uh, have my own, um, my own project, create a new project? Creating a new project is just creating a new directory in the file system. Yes. Again, can is you do that? No from the, oh. not within the GUI. Again, for the same reason that I had <coughs> tried to explain before. In professional GUIs, mm -hmm. uh, development environments, you have all the capabilities in the project manager to manage the file system, create directories, move files around directories, delete them. But we decided not to implement it in this UI because this is not a tool intended. The graphical user interface is not intended to replace your preferred development environment. Let's, let's try to do it. Um, okay, this is the project pie. This is the file system. I will create another copy. Somehow the GUI checks for changes and it updates automatically. So you can have it open and your preferred ID open and you will be aware of the changes. Do you have like a remote version of the software? A remote version of the software. Uh, what do you mean by remote? That you work open the trainer locally, you work locally, and at some point you want to remotely launch on Cori. Yes. In order to do that, you just have to set up the appropriate execution command to transfer what you need to through Slurm or through SSH to copy everything you need to Cori and launch and the I process. It's up to you how to do it because it depends on the organization of your project. Sorry? So you run the trainer Where? visualization tool. You run the visualization tool from Cori? From my laptop. From your laptop. But I just received a yeah, from the command It may be interesting to analyze how you use it to see if we can somehow <coughs> do something similar for the project. So I think that uh, the user is uh, probably uh, referring to something like the GDT's remote client. Yes, 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 very you can run on desktop, but you can actually um, you can interface, you can, you know, uh, configure and uh, start the job from desktop and you can actually run, uh, connect the run on Cori to get, get the results back. It's a question, correct? That's, that's, I, I think that's what, 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 what,
Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So, yeah, okay. So you can you can take a look at the DDC our DDC web page, and uh, there is a section about the remote client. Okay. Yeah, you can take a look at it. Okay, we can take a look at it to see how it works and see if we can implement a similar feature here. And probably it's not very important for like the um, coding software, but for me, network interface is very slow in terms of visualization. I think that's when you are using it in the small company and the command line tool is probably not that useful. Okay. So essentially, it is local execution of the tool in your laptop. You work locally, and at some point, you say, I want to launch this remotely on Cori or another system. And that's what the, this tool. That's what this NX is for. So everything remotely, you want to run on Cori, launch NX first. Okay. The answer is no, it's not available yet. But it's something probably interesting to look at it to see how the other tool works. I open only one file, but if you open several files, if I change to new file, you can see that it has no versions. And if I click and activate again Pi, it has its own versions. So this hidden directory keeps track of the versions that exist for each of the files that you have here. So they are associated in the UI. Did you rescans any change in the directory that is the path where the project is located? Yeah. Files, directories, anything that you add in the file system. Okay. What else? We still have five five minutes. Um, Let me show you, let's restore the original version. And um, let me show you then this part that you will have to use in the practical, okay? If you remember, we said that for each pattern, we have different ways of making the implementation, okay? GPU of loading with OpenMB? Uh, Open yeah. So here again, you have the beginning and the end of the parallel region, the directive to make the work sharing. But additionally, in, in, GP, in offloading to GPUs, you need to trans manage data transfers. In OpenMP, you do that with the pragma target. And map is the clause that accepts several options. Two is transferring information from the CPU to the GPU. From is from the GPU to the CPU. And two from is to the CPU, GPU, computation at the end from the GPU to the CPU. In OpenACC, I think I have this version here. So we can create some things and then distribute the lists around the things, like in the second slide. Sorry? Yeah. So you should be like going to things, distribute values or something like that. Yeah. At this moment, this is something we discussed yesterday. Uh, best practices for GPU programming recommend that instead of using parallel for within target, that you use team distribute parallel for to give the compiler freedom to generate better quality code for the GPU. This is something that will come in 1.3 probably. 
but it is something that we will definitely do. At this moment, you can do it by editing here. It's just, this is a complete editor, so you can come to the editor, themes, distribute, you save the file, you now, you can save, name a different version. Teams, and you can compile it automatically. Okay? So this is something we will add in the, in the in future versions. We will see that in the, in the, after the break, why it's important to specify teams distribute parallel on the GPU. And how you do that in, in OpenACC, that they have the equivalent GAN worker version notation and terminology. We will see that later. Okay? So, yes, this is a complete editor, as you have in any other tool. You can modify, save versions, and keep on working with them. And all the versions you save will be stored in the file system so you can take away all the work you have done. Okay, so in one minute, I think I can finish. The last demo, that is. Okay, what happens if I want to parallelize this loop in OpenMP or in OpenACC using a different strategy? Let's say I want to use atomic protection. I click on parallelize and compare these two versions. They are exactly, they are correct implementations of exactly the same original sequential code. The difference is how do we implement this scalar reduction operation? We have several strategies. The default strategy is whenever it is available in the standard, use the reduction clause. But maybe there, be, there may be situations where you have a reduction operation that is not supported by the standard. Or you want to use Instead of the scalar variables, you, want, you need to use arrays. Arrays are not supported for reduction operations in OpenMP and OpenACC in general, except some exceptions. So in that case, you can still generate parallel code. What you need to do is the rest of the implementation is the same. It only changes the way this reduction sum is handled. In this case, it's through atomic reduction. Sorry, through the reduction clause. And in this case, it's by guaranteeing mutual exclusion when each thread is computing and accessing the sum operator, okay? So what, you, what I want to show you here is just that using this part of the panel, I will restore again. Using this part of the dialog, you can control which of these uh, parallelization strategies you want to implement. And the trainer will generate different parallel versions that you can later compile, run, measure the performance, and select the one that is faster on your system, okay? So we will, you will explore this in detail in the practicals after, after lunch. So we will go into the details of, of all of this, okay? Okay, so now, yes, I think it's time to stop to make the coffee break. Thank you so much for, for being so interactive. It's really a pleasure to have so many questions from the audience is not always the case. So really, really great. Let's keep on like that after after the break.